on episode 99 of the Insure Tech Geek podcast, talking about AI, fraud, and insurance with Nikos Vecchiardis from Attestive. The Insure Tech Geek podcast powered by JB Knowledge is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives into specific tech we see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. And we are here again. Hey, Rob Galbraith, what's going on, bud? Hey, James. We are uh, officially into December now as we record this. So getting down to the holidays and into the year. I I know. We got all our vests on and our jackets because Texas, it got below 55. And so now (laughs) we're actually (laughs) a little chilly. I mean, it kind of like the the part of you that's Michigan laughs whenever Texans start shivering at 50, right? Oh, I've joined them. I've joined them. The blood is thinned over the years. So yeah, I was, I was, uh, I walked outside this morning. I was like, whoa, hey, it's kind of cold out today. <laughs> Time for get the gloves out, get the hat out. I, I, I'm part of this workout group. I had the hat on earlier, walking the dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of this workout group called <laughs> F3, and it's a volunteer men's group. We, we work out in a park, you know, outdoors. It's all volunteer led, so no one pays anybody any money. It's great. But we meet at 5:30 in the morning. At a, at a city park on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays. And so it is early and cold. It was 38 degrees this morning <laughs> doing the workout. So we had a good one, but it's, uh, it's, uh, look, it's, it's good being in December. It's, uh, it's good to be close to Christmas. It's one of my favorite times of the year. And uh, we've got a, a, a friend, a new friend, uh, who is from a, a, a colder, snowier part of the country, Salt Lake City. Now he's not from there. He's a Boston guy, really. But he's recently transplanted to Salt Lake City. Uh, Nikos, it is so good to have you on the show. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me here, James. Yeah, it's really great to have you on. And I I know you just moved to Salt Lake City six months ago. Are you excited about your first ski season there? Oh, it's it, it's great, and of course, you know I'm used to snow in Boston. I mean, I I I did chuckle when you said uh, 38 degrees. I mean, <laughs> anything over freezing is warm, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's uh, it, it to- totally is, especially, you know, you Boston guys are, you're just particularly tough, you know, you just, you just, you just hardened by those new England winners, but uh, it's all good. We're, we're glad to have you on. So we're going to, we're going to chat about tech, but before we do, let's chat about you. Um, you actually, uh, you got a bachelor's in electrical engineering from MIT. It's uh, a little, uh, little school there in Cambridge, uh, <laughs> fantastic school. <laughs> That I had the, the the pleasure of living right next to for three months of my life. I I I, I did a lot of runs around MIT's campus, and uh, then you got your uh, your master's over at Carnegie Mellon, and then and embarked on a on a pretty neat career through the uh, software and technology industry, uh, and then uh, you know wound up over here in in insurance and insure tech. Just tell us, uh, you know, where were you born and raised, and what did you dream of doing when you were a kid? Well, I was born and raised in, in, in the Boston area. So, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, I mean, t- t- technology was always my, my thing. I mean, I, I, you know, I used to take things apart from a, from a young age, to, much to the dismay of, of my parents, right? Uh, you know, things I wasn't supposed to take apart. <laughs> and, uh, figure I put them back together. And, you know, sometimes it would work out. Sometimes I'd come up with a few spare parts and, uh, you know, nobody was happy about that. But, uh, you know, the engineering was kind of right in my, you know, it, it was a, a little bit of uh, uh, d- definitely my sweet spot there. And uh, I knew I was going to be an engineer. And uh, uh, certainly I've, I've transitioned to software, but uh, that's that's really where where, where it's at. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I transitioned to management. But, uh, yeah, I knew from a young age that uh, that, that this was my uh, calling. Now I was in a similar boat. I, I started writing uh, software when I was around eleven, twelve, and just fell in love with technology and computing uh, at an early age before the internet was around. So I was I was involved in bulletin board systems and C and Fortran and Pascal and assembly and all this old stuff. I loved it. I thought it was great, and uh, I was in the same boat. I, I really, you know, fell in love with it. Were Were you always a software guy, or were you, were, did you ever get into network administration and computer, you know, building computers. I mean, you, you were at MIT in the nineties, man, like that, that was, 
that was when the internet commercialized. I mean, there was a lot going on that transformed the world there. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. No, I, I um, my thesis was uh, was on new uh, uh, protocols uh, that were kind of more efficient than TCP/IP at the time, and uh, of course, none of them stuck because you know we're, we're using TCP/IP uh, even today. But 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 that's uh, yeah, but I, I've been all over the network side, the, uh, you know, I mean, gosh, I, I still build my own computers. I mean, it's just, you know, that's a lifelong just, nerd. Know, put them together. Yeah. Right? You know, and, and then when I, you know, when, when I got out of school, I mean, my first job out of school was with Encore Computer, and that was a, a multi processing computer company, which was, which was cool, except, you know, it's probably ever, you know, everything they did, you can fit on a, on a chip would be one of the smaller chips these days. So uh, yeah, the world, world has transformed, but yeah, software was the way everything was going. And, uh, you know, I started writing code at an early age too. So it was, uh, you know, it was an easy transition. Man, that's awesome. And, uh, I, I just remember the, the early nineties as this period of radical transformation because we went from disconnected computers uh, you know, well, really from mainframes to personal computers that were not connected to work groups and local networking, bulletin board systems, and then the internet just exploded onto the scene. And yes, we still are using TCP IP and uh, we're still struggling with a migration to IPv6. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we're still struggling with, but but it, it, was, a, it was a super exciting time to get started. So just walk me through you know, you had, you had a bunch of stops along the way, um, at, you know, like, like at great companies too, like Sun, Hewlett Packard, um, EMC, I mean, some really big companies mixed in with a bunch of like startups or smaller companies. Mm -hmm. Um, was there ever a path to insurance? At what point did you end up kind of leaning over towards financial services and insurance? Well, well it's, uh, it's interesting. What, what happened is, uh, you know, I settled in around data protection and data availability and that, that meant different things at different times, right? It's, it started off with uh, how you back up your data and, you know, I'm going to say the T word tape used to be mm. a thing and uh i did take back before you kind of put yeah put that put, put it in the cloud i mean it's still being used in certain circumstances but uh but but that was really where it was but then you know there were other reasons to protect your data viruses uh you know i mean you wrote, fast forward to, to, to today and you have uh, ransomware and, and things like that so so it was always that was always the area where we were working in in protecting your data whether it's using the cloud uh, or, or other, or other technologies. And, uh, what brought us to, uh, insurance is, uh, you know, it became more of a question. It started becoming more of a question is, is my data reliable? Like, can I trust this data? You know, what does that even mean? Uh, was this corrupted somehow? And then, uh, as we moved into the insurance world and we started talking to insurance folks, it's, wait a second, it's, it's fraud. It's $300 billion worth of fraud every year in the U.S. Uh, you know, can we use some of the data that comes in, analyze it, and, and maybe automate the process of identifying fraud? And that's, that's what drove us to where we are today. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a lot of startups along the way. This is actually my third. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a lot of fun. That's great. And that, so let's talk about this company, your CEO of Attestive. What does it do, mm -hmm. uh, in the insurance industry? Like what, what, what function does this perform and what do you sell and, and how do you do it? Well, we provide automated fraud protection for digital media. What does that mean? Photos, videos, documents, uh, the insurance world is going to automated claims where sometimes all you have are photos, videos, or documents to settle a claim. Um, and, and now you have to use these to determine uh, if somehow they're, they're fraudulent. And you can do, and, and what's happened is that there's a number of tools that you can use to alter reality these days. Uh, and, and they're getting much more sophisticated. Right. Uh, yeah, sure. You have photoshops. I can change the photos. Uh, but did you did you know Apple in iOS 15 lets you change the time or location of your photos and roll them up into things that look like brand new photos? So I take a photo from my neighbor's house and I change the location to my house. Uh, it's kind of a great feature, except unless you're the insurance carrier who's looking at this and and paying a claim on, on the wrong house. Uh, 
I mean, it's technology like that. And then even the more sophisticated stuff, the AI, the deep fakes, you can build synthetic media. Uh, so as, as looking toward the future, this becomes a big problem for insurance, particularly as they're thinking of claims automation, right? Uh, that means self-service perhaps on the insured side, I'm taking pictures of my vehicle. And then on the carrier side, it's all done by AI and machine learning. Uh, and you get a check in the mail. Uh, so the question is, who's looking at the photos? Who's looking at the documents? Who's determining if there's fraud? And how do you do that in real time? And that's exactly what we saw. In a world filled with deep fakes, attestives <laughs> on the job. I mean, right? Like this, this is a deep fake world. We're, we're looking at the, the ability for your average citizen who knows nothing about programming to deep fake audio video, photos. I mean, it, this is going to get more and more and more challenging, is it not? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing the, the scale of this problem. I mean, you know, just look at social media and, and social, it's interesting. Social media doesn't care as much about at this point, it's, it's become a little bit more uh, of an issue, but on the other hand, you know, they're just looking for clicks. Uh, but insurance, Boy, it, it it affects your claims. It affects your loss ratio. It's big time. It affects the whole business. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a huge impact, and it's not. It, you know, we think about fraud a lot in insurance. We have to think about fraud a lot, but but actually questioning the validity of photographic and video evidence is something that <laughs> I don't think enough people are are taking seriously. How it is, how easy it is to manipulate images, videos, audio. Uh, it's it's a it's a brave new world, and someone's got to going to do something about it. Rob, what you got? Yeah, I love uh, that we're talking about this topic today, James, and so glad to have you on, Nikos. I, I recently read a book on deepfakes called Trust No One. It was very eye-opening about um, how easy it is for folks to do and, and the progress that's been made in this software just in the last five years to make uh, even somebody such as me that doesn't have the programming background that the two of you have, right, semi-competent in, in making a, a decent-looking deepfake that could fool a lot of AI systems that, that haven't uh, relied on the latest technology. So, Nikos, I, I'm fascinated. What does a week in, in your life look like? I, I imagine you certainly have some, you know, technical uh, uh you know, new new products, new projects that you're working on and the engineering side. Uh, obviously, we've said this is a, a constantly evolving space, but then you've also got this education part and letting um, a lot of folks in the insurance industry, business professionals such as myself that are, are not technologists, uh, such as the two of you, kind of making them aware of this issue and letting them know how a test can help. So just kind of curious, maybe you can walk us through what your typical week looks like. Right, right. I mean, my, my typical week, uh, I, you know, I'm the first to say I hate Mondays. So, so I usually pack a lot into Monday since it's going to be a bad day anyway. Uh, that's where I sit with my team and, and, and we reload for the week. I mean, it's, it's about, you know, what's our sales plan and, and being in a startup, these things change so fluidly, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it, you, you learn something one week and then you realize, hey, we're really on to something now. Uh, we got to change the way we do things. So we have our sales meetings, marketing meetings, uh, my my management team meetings, all the first day, really to get everybody loaded and locked and loaded for 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 what this week will look like. So it's it's uh, you know we've taken a day that's usually you know everybody's least favorite day, and we've we've made it uh, into something that's productive and still everybody's least favorite day. Uh, but then moving on to the week, it's it's just a whirlwind between uh, customer meetings. Yeah, it's it's educating. Uh, it's it's getting out there uh, at least you know once a month. Uh, we have the conferences. Uh, we were at ITC. Uh, we were recently at uh, at Guidewire Connections. Uh, so really getting out there and 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 spreading this message and and, and getting people educated. Uh, it's it's not just about fraud either. It's 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 because you know fraud doesn't get people as excited sometimes, but but it's just a necessary component to the automation. Uh, so so kind of getting that across is hey, if you want to automate, then you have to automate your fraud detection, and that's that's where we can help. We become a necessary component, and we can help save you money through automation without losing it on the other side uh, due to losses and fraud. So, so that's where we 
really come in. So, so yeah, it's talking to customers, uh, gosh, talking to investors, you know, being in a startup, uh, you're always out there uh, trying to get the message out to investors as well. So, uh, so it, it, it's very busy. Like I said, the, the, the weeks go by uh, incredibly fast. As they say, uh, the days are long and the weeks are short. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it can, it can so be, it, it can, it can be exhausting. Our, our Mondays are fun. We, we run on a system called EOS entrepreneurial operating system, which is the best decision I made ever starting in, in, in running this business the last 21 years to have a methodology to run my business. And so we have these weekly team meetings on Monday called level 10 meetings. And it, it actually turned my Mondays into fun days for me. I enjoy it. I enjoy planning the week out and setting to do's and, you know, checking on our quarterly rocks and looking at our plan. So it's a lot of fun, but I totally, I totally get it. Let's, let's jump into AI. There's a lot of fake AI out there. There's a lot of like really, really, really fake fraudulent AI. <laughs> um, <laughs> that it's, it's, it's not AI because it's really just a, a, a set of conditional statements, you know, if then statements, or it's, it's an expert system, but not, you know, it doesn't utilize machine learning or AI. So um, let's talk, you know, true AI which I think we're still 30 to 40 years from where you have like the singularity, you have, you have a, you have a general purpose AI. I, I think we're a long way away from um, what we're using right now is like specific forms of AI. So let's talk about the stuff that's actually legitimately uh, deep learning, machine learning, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. Um, not the fake stuff. That's just a bunch of it thin statements. Like when I first saw chat bots come out, I was like, that's not a, that's not a chat bot. That's a, anti-text terminal interface that I wrote in sixth grade. And, and, you know, so what, what, what AI and new tech do you think is going to help insurance that's actually delivering value right now? And what do you think could actually hurt insurance? Sure. The, the, the pieces that are delivering value is, uh, yeah. So we use AI for, for training on, on images, right? So for instance, uh, you can do a lot with images, uh, and, and, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of rules based stuff that we do. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I don't want to hide from that because it's, it's true. We, we run over 40 models on every single picture uh, within seconds. Uh, but, but some of them are AI and that means we've done this training. So, so yeah. we can tell the difference between a, a photo of a screen, a photo of a photo and, and something that's uh, an original. Uh, we've, we've built you know, and we've had to train on on literally, you know, thousands and tens of thousands uh, of examples in order to to get this right. So, so it is uh, it it is training in that sense. We also have what we call deep analysis of photos that can highlight uh, where uh, they might have been modified. So, when you're looking at things like Photoshop, so or even uh, even the deep fakes where. Uh, you're combining elements into a single photo. We can identify uh, by looking at noise patterns uh, what is actually uh, potentially uh, altered in the photo, uh, and we can highlight it with heat maps. So, so all of that is done by by our products uh, today, and the same holds true for documents. Being able to identify text that is slightly off, uh, doesn't belong there. Uh, but it is it it is training the system. I mean, could it could a human do this? Yeah, if if you train the human the same way, you know, if you ingest a hundred thousand documents, uh, some fake, some real, and you make the you learn how to make those decisions. But uh, this is where AI comes in, and and it's about you know really eliminating a lot of labor or maybe impossible things that have been impossible uh, to do otherwise. Yeah, without having to explicitly program things too. That that's. The key with machine learning and machine learning models for me is that you don't have to code every potential thing. You, you're saying, here's the good stuff. You're training your data sets, right? Here's yes. the good stuff. Here's the bad stuff. Figure out how to identify it. <laughs> and and you know, it, has, it has a little bit of freedom of interpretation. Uh, and obviously, as you, as you train your model, it gets better and then you recompile it and then you have a smarter model. Um, you know, and it's, it's ideally going to give you a higher accuracy rate. I've seen some fascinating things about machine learning models around diagnosing, uh, you know, cancer, you know, tumors, reading, you know, doing, doing, you know, image reading on, on medical imagery, MRIs and x-rays and ultrasounds and, uh, machine learning has got a crazy high accuracy rate in, in medical imaging. 
and and that's that you know so i think there's there's a lot to be said for image analysis voice analysis video analysis and particularly because humans get so bored doing it that they often don't do this job well they're very expensive to have do this and they get really bored and so i think there's a this is one of those jobs that people are happy to have a machine take over for them so that's that's the positive side what's the negative side like where is ai actually introducing big problems for insurance well it's 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 creating ability to uh have this alternate reality right i mean this is uh, I can change things. I could change things and wrap them up in a way that they look relatively original. Uh, and that's, I think that's where it's hurting. I can go to uh, this X does not exist. This car does not exist.com. It's, it's a site that uh, uses generative adversarial networks to, to create photos of, of vehicles. Uh, you know, rumor has it, the, the you know, the, the Tesla cyber truck was just, you know, design based on that site. They just, it just spit it out as a, <laughs> as a random vehicle. Uh, but, but, but it's, it's all there and it's, it's all available and it can, uh, it can be very disruptive and problematic. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the world has gone so virtual the past few years. I mean, I mean, do you know, I mean, how, how do you even verify that I'm not this bot here, you know, sitting in front of you? Um, you know, how, you know, how, how do you do that? Well, you know, you can fake somebody's voice, you can train on somebody's voice, uh, and then you can start making phone calls as, as me. And that's happened, uh, not to me, thankfully, but it's happened to others where you get a phone call from the CEO saying, I'd like you to make this, uh, this wire transfer. Sometimes people do it. Uh, so yeah, it, it can cause a, a significant amount of problems with, with fraud in insurance. It could cause just a corporate, uh, in any corporation, it could lead to fraud. Although I, I'd say a podcast interview would be a pretty good Turing test for a, <laughs> for a, for a deep fake. <laughs> See, how long, how long can the bot hang during a podcast interview, right? Like that'd be the, the well, look, I mean, everybody uses virtual backgrounds. How long before we get the virtual foreground to go? With oh yeah. Like, why not? True. I mean, you can already, why not? Yeah. Like, why, why not? I, I agree. I mean, the, the video for sure that the, the first thing will be the video. And then the second thing will be the voice the voice right. and then the then the third thing will be the actual content <laughs> um <laughs> yeah because yeah, it's it's uh it's interesting where it's a brave it's a brave new world we got to get our hands around isn't isn't it rob uh, absolutely and um no i was thinking uh um i came across the other day a great example of deep fakes um and i i'm apologize i'm forgetting the name but it's basically called lunar disaster and it is a recreation of the Apollo landing uh, with real footage from that. But essentially, it's what if something happened to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin? What if they died on the moon? And so it looks like a newscast. It looks like the real event. But it's a deep fake. It has this tragedy. And then it has uh, President Nixon addressing the nation, giving a speech that was written for him um to deliver in case something went wrong so it's actual words that were scripted by his speech writers and the 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 deep fake was trained on his voice and the images from all the presidential addresses uh, that he had done sitting at his desk so if you didn't know that this was a fake i mean it is very real very very convincing so there's lots of other examples out there I encourage our our listeners and, and viewers to look for some examples and you'll see kind of what Nikos is really talking about in, in the need. Like the, the, I think in the past, you know, we've thought about these deep fakes as, you know, mentioned Photoshop, right? It's pretty easy to, 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 for a human to identify, but the, this latest generation stuff, it, it, it's not, I mean, you, the, the, what is fake, what is real? That's a real, you know, conundrum and it's only going to get more of a, an issue going forward. Nikos, I'm, I'm fascinated, you know, We've talked a lot about just this particular um, problem and, and the technology, a little bit about the technology that you've used to, to try to fight it. But just in general, like what are some innovation trends or, or technological trends that you think are going to really impact the uh, the insurance industry moving forward? Well, I, I think uh, all aspects of automation and, and, and a lot of it using AI. I mean, you think of a motor vehicle claim, uh, you're asked to take the photo. Photos are submitted. 
uh, somebody like a testive will verify that, hey, these are real. They're not some sort of alternate reality that somebody created. Um, and then they go into a, an AI-based appraisal system, right? They, the, the appraisal system is going to, you know, put this all together and then you get a check. Uh, and in most cases, you know, it's probably no worse than the appraisal that you got from, you know, a person coming to your house and looking at the car and, uh, you know, taking a few pictures there. So, so it's, it's, it's a huge, this, this automation is a huge breakthrough. Um, and then the, the other thing is, uh, you know, there's so much more data that, uh, that, you know, when, as you apply AI, that you can extract from, from all of this, uh, you know, digital media, photos, videos, documents, there's a lot more than a, a human being has time to extract. Uh, and I think it creates a wealth of information as well for, for, for uh, insurance and making better decisions. So, so that's kind of how I see it impacting the future. But I think, you know, AI and automation is, is, is key here. And it's, uh, it's, it's really starting to transform the space. I, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, a lot of analysts are saying 2025, 70% of, of standard claims are going to be automated. So that's, that's a lot. Uh, and it makes for better user experiences too. I, I think it's great if I could just take a few photos. Ideally it does. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen enough sci-fi movies to know that, uh, there's a potential bad outcome on the other, on the other end of this. I mean, uh, you know, if you have if you have uh, a lot of decisions being made that require someone to appeal because they were a terrible decision or they they underpaid for the claim and there's no human for them to appeal to and then you know the, so I, I think in an ideal world yeah there's a there's a lot of really good opportunity for that we've just got to craft the the tooling around it to make sure that uh, we we still have people and services behind it that can deal with the exceptions right uh, in, in particular in the early days as uh, as you continue to train the models. Yeah, and, uh, and that's the, that's and that's the beauty of if 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 we if you do it right, um, when you spot anomalies, you know they're not processed automatically. So being able to do this proactively, right, and that's what we do, right. In seconds, we can tell you whether a claim is good or suspect, and we're not going to tell you it's bad because uh, we always err on the side of. It's, it's suspect and somebody has to look at it. So we, we switch over to a, a human being. Uh, and and that, that's the way it should be. Clearly, you don't want to have a machine accusing you of, uh, <laughs> of, of fraud. You want to have human review there. Uh, and then sometimes a human review may reveal that there's an honest error. We just send, a, send a, an adjuster over, figure it out. Uh, or, you know, there could even be process issues. I mean, you know, like who shrunk the photos? It's like, uh, it is the biggest thing we see across the industry is, is, you know, photo manipulation, uh, is sort of the inadvertent shrinking of photos. Oh, I'm saving space. Uh, but then, you know, at the end of the day, you might be left with a thumbnail to settle a claim. Uh, now this isn't fraud. It's just kind of bad practice, but but we we've seen everything from uh, from that all the way to people just sending in photos from their screens, downloads from Google search. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it really really is. Rob. So Nikos, I'm just curious, like uh, you know, what's next for Attestive? What's on your roadmap? You particularly this unstructured data, right? Which I know ninety percent of it has been there for a long time in the insurance industry and just wasn't made use, right? So we've had all this fielded data, these databases, relational databases that were the bread and butter of running insurance operations. And now we can finally use, right, ins property inspection reports and, and medical imagery, as James referred to, these photos of vehicles, things like that. So I'm just kind of curious what's on uh, your roadmap and kind of what's on your uh, future horizon looking at to, to take a test of. It's an interesting concept. Like, imagine if you can monetize claims, right? Claims is a loss center. Uh, you know, how do you monetize? Well, you have so much data that's going in and you're not always doing things with it, right? And if you can use that to make better decisions, uh, so you can, you know, whether looking back retrospectively at them and saying, well, these, you know, now I have examples of what a what an overpayment looks like, or I have examples of what this this type of accident should look like and, and, you know, be able to, 
figure out the anomalies uh, from that. So, so making smarter decisions uh, is something that uh, you can do. And there's a lot of, you know, detailed analysis of, of, of the photos, uh, you know, that can happen, uh, that can save a lot of money. It's, you know, do you have to send a, you know, do you have a, to send an expert, uh, an engineer to look at hail damage? Uh, sometimes you do, but that can be very expensive. You know, what if you had AI that could determine that, hey, this is hail damage, this is not hail damage, and this is, this is uh, somebody hitting the roof with a hammer. Uh, so if you had a way to distinguish between all three, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great advancement. Absolutely. There's, there's a, uh, a huge world in front of us, I think, <laughs> on, on where we can go. And it's, uh, it's amazing how machine learning and analysis of unstructured data has, has woven its way into daily life. Uh, I know I use image search on a daily basis now, just inside my photos app on my iPhone. I search for objects and people that it recognizes. And you know, I don't tag photos anymore. I just use their machine learning and the AI they've built uh, around photos and uh, to to search for stuff all the time. I mean, it's it's it really remarkable how, how we use this on a daily basis. Um, I am excited about the where, where the future can go with this, though, because, I mean, I think the the end result is we want to detect fraud quickly. We want to detect legitimate claims quickly. Um, you know, you talked about roofing, you know, Florida, every time there's a hurricane, you know, you have this whole spate of, of roof of fake roofing claims. And, um, you know, the, the laws there just changed to try and protect the insurer a little bit more because they were just doing full no deductible, <laughs> full cost replacement on roofs. If there was even a little bit of damage and you have no way of knowing if the guy just got a hammer out and just hit the roof with a hammer. And so yeah. I'm 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 certainly excited because I think that this type of technology is going to save many property carriers from going out of business from fraudulent claims, um, and and has the uh, the potential to really expedite legitimate claims. That's what we want. I think that's like a twofold objective, right? We want to expedite legitimate claims and we want to deny all the fraud, and we want to do both of those faster, right? And this is one of the technologies that can actually enable that, in particular with auto and property. Um, but, but even with work comp where you, where you might have job site video footage and you can pull the footage up and see how they were lifting and see if they jumped off the bed of their truck and broke the rules or, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. And if you could take this all the way into surveillance too. Right. And, and, and the other, the other interesting thing is, is, you know, everybody has one of these smart devices and if you can create trust the way we do, uh, on this device, so you can say, Hey, everything you take can be tamper proof and trustworthy. Now you can think about loss control a little bit differently, right? Is, well, how do we get the losses down is, well, you know, maybe it is through self-service through all of this data that we're not gathering uh, that doesn't happen at the point of a claim. Uh, if we could have all of that data, then maybe we'll be better prepared uh, to reduce the losses, reduce the claims losses uh, figure out if people are ready for the next hurricane as opposed to just paying out when it happens. Yeah, I mean, if you just look at the nature of cameras on board, the, let's say the new, the new iPhone 14 or go back to the 13, if you go to the Pro with LiDAR, you, you know, if you build a native app that actually engages the LiDAR sensor and you can, you can pull in photo and video, audio and LiDAR, you have a, you have a much more tamper-proof, uh, you know, documented, uh, documented claim experience. Um, so there's a, there's a lot more that you can collect now too that I, you know I'm I'm particularly excited about um, e even with you know the the advent of live images that that Apple came up with where you have a, a, a you know a low frame rate video backup behind the photo along with a audio layer <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we can do to to prove that something actually is true and and it's not a fake and um, you know it was not just screenshotted off the internet <laughs> or texted to them by a friend or you know whatever. You know, there's, 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 there's really sophisticated fraud. And then there's the really cheap fraud that people do all the time. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you start with, uh, you know, solving for, for the cheaper fraud, but uh, certainly as, as, you know, as technology gets more sophisticated, you need, um, you need protection against all of it. And that's, that's where we come in. We have the roadmap that provides that uh, and we're constantly you know, figuring out what the next uh, next thing, you know, sometimes it's Apple letting you edit things uh, and making them uh, imperceptible. 
Uh, but regardless, uh, we're, you know, that's what we're always on, on top of. And we're, uh, we're building new technology to help uh, combat the fraud and, and really build confidence in automation. And that's ultimately the end game is build some confidence in the automation so that uh, you can trust it. Yeah. And just to remind people how big the fraud problem is, because it's one of my favorite sections in Rob's book. Uh, where you talk about the you know the cost of fraud and how it gets passed on to the consumer, um, the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud, which is insurancefraud.org, says that uh, it's approximately three hundred and eight point six billion dollars every year that insurance fraud steals from American consumers, um, and that it it occurs in about ten percent of property casualty insurance losses. So this is not like a, this is a big number. It's a big number, and it's a it's a material part of the cost of insurance. And of course, if something's a material part of the cost of insurance, it's a material part of the cost of life because uh, life requires insurance. I mean, and literally, because you know, the federal government required that several years ago, which was challenged in the Supreme Court, but still, you still have to have insurance if you want to function. And if 10% of claims are fraudulent, you got $308 billion every year that this impacts consumers. This is a problem worth working on. Rob, I, I know you, you hit this hard in your book. Yeah, and I think not only that, uh, James, but I've talked to, um, you know, from an insure tech landscape, right? There's been a lot of companies that have focused on new product innovation, new distribution channels, right? Growing revenue. Uh, and then there's been those that have focused on automation and cutting expenses. And particularly during the talent crisis, we've seen this huge wave of retirements. Um, that's probably the number one topic I've talked to people about this year. They want to know how do we backfill for those folks? Uh, I've heard about you know, internship programs for claims and underwriters and whatnot that are 22 months in length. And I'm like, okay, th that th th nobody wants to sit through that anymore, right? And so, um, yes, some of those people that are retiring are going to be replaced by the next generation. But quite frankly, a lot of those folks are ultimately going to be replaced by AI uh, doing some of the stuff that, that Nikos is talking about. Claims is probably the area that I think uh, companies have, have underinvested in the insure tech uh, space just because nobody wants to mess with their book. There's obviously a lot of regulation uh, requirements, things like that. Um, so it could be a touchy subject. I know you know that very well, James, in terms of, you know, somebody selling technology to that space. But, but fraud is one that's probably the most straightforward in terms of a business case, right, to say, hey, we can make and, and justify this type of investment fairly easily because you only need to reduce a fraction of the, the fraud to, uh, to, to make the, the economics work on investing in this type of technology. And that actually can fund, as you've talked about, uh, Nika, some of the other automation uh, uh, investments and you know, maybe that's a, a new core systems replacement or whatnot, but making sure that you catch that fraud piece to me, that's a, relatively low hanging fruit for claims organizations looking where to uh, invest in the technology space. Yeah. Awesome. So let's bring it home and, and wrap it up. Uh, Nico. So uh, what, what kind of closing thoughts do you have for our listeners about uh, fraud and image detection and all the, all the things you're doing at a testive and, and uh, just the broader space of the use of AI in, uh, in insurance. Well, AI is is transforming the insurance industry, and uh, it's it's affecting the insurance industry in many ways. Um, it's it's a highly competitive industry, uh, as as you know, and uh, certainly automation helps. Uh, but in order to do that automation, you know, at minimum, you don't want the fraud to get any worse, uh, and that's really. Uh, you know, it makes the case for for automated fraud detection is, you know, don't do automation without it. Um, and, you know, you know, one can you, you can argue that, uh, you know, fraud has always been part of insurance for, you know, 100 years. But I think the speed of technology, uh, the the uh, movement uh, toward virtual claims, the movement uh, toward automation uh, is picking up steam right now. Uh, so, you know, carriers should not drop the ball. They should really focus on, you know, how to make fraud, par fraud protection part of that strategy. 100%. And uh, people can find out more information at attestive.com, A-T-T-E-S-T-I-V.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you can also contact us at info at attestive.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. There you go. Always happy to chat. 
Awesome. Got your Boston guy in uh, in Utah. Enjoy uh, enjoy the ski slopes for me this winter. <laughs> yeah, I think there's snow. Yeah, there's snow coming this weekend. They're already open. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, nice. a, it's getting cold early, so you guys are going to have some uh, some earlier snow than maybe the last year or two. So in, enjoy that for me, and and uh, in, enjoy that beautiful state you live in now. And thanks for coming on, uh, InsureTech Geek, and and just geeking out with us about AI and fraud and insurance. I really appreciate it. Yeah, th- thank you for having me here, James. Uh, and and certainly, you know, enjoy your cold spell in Texas. I know it's, uh, <laughs> I know they're pretty rare. <laughs> they are. Yeah, it was it was seventy five and humid two three days ago. It'll be back there next week. So <laughs> it, it's it's always around the corner. And uh, and Rob, uh, thanks as always for joining me, brother. Absolutely, always a pleasure. And thank you for tuning in today to Geek Out episode ninety nine. That's right, hundreds around the corner. Our interview with Nikos Vecchiardes from Attestive. See you next time. This has been the InsureTech Geek podcast uh, powered by JB Knowledge. That's jbknowledge.com. It's all about transforming and disrupting the insurance world. I've been your host, James Benham. That's jamesbenham.com with co-host Rob Galbraith. That's endofinsurance.com. Big thanks to Jim Greenlee, our podcast producer, Kara dalton Alro, our creative producer. And thank you for joining us today. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride and geek out. See you next time.